gifts are being honored and we can just play in the field that we actually want to play in. Today we are going to have a modern day hidden figure who's going to be joining us and we're going to be talking about all kinds of things that you know sometimes we don't talk about on this show. This is Sunny Chase, the Sunny Chase Show. We're in Hollywood, and we're going to go ahead, and I'm actually going to, normally I don't do this, but today I'm going to do a little bit of giving you guys an idea of who my guest is, Olympia LaPointe. Okay, after months of working with Zhao, and we'll find out who that person is, and my original team, I received the 1999 Boeing Growth and Innovation Award, this is Olympia speaking, from her book. I received this award because one of my quality reports helped save the company $100,000 in costs. A year passed, and I finally received the recognition I was awaiting. In 2000, management informed me that I would start working with Zhao and his team. I was told that my math skills were best used as a rocket scientist. My role was to calculate the probability of the catastrophic explosion of each of the space shuttle's three main engines. At the time, we had four space shuttles, Discovery, Endeavor, Atlantis, and Columbia. My job was to foresee and mitigate potential explosions on the launch pad during start and within flight. After three years on Zhao's team, I received the 2003 Black Engineer of the Year Modern Day <laughs> Technology Leader Award, which was recognized for my mathematical analysis that helped secure $55 million in new engine contracts. The following year, I received the 2004 Boeing Company Professional Excellence Award for my innovative contributions to the company. These awards were a sign that I needed to continue making a significant difference in science as well as breaking down stereotypes. So that gives you a little idea of our beautiful, incredible, and extraordinary guest. Olympia, welcome to our show. Thank you for having me. Thank my you. pleasure, my pleasure. So I'd like you to kind of jump right in. Well, thank you so much for actually reading um, <laughs> my book. And it's so amazing because I, you know how you write a book and you're like thinking, I hope someone actually will read this. And it's so amazing for you to read that on the air. So thank you so much for oh doing that. Oh my gosh, you're welcome. I have a few other uh, <laughs> priceless tidbits for you guys too. Thank you. You're so welcome. Thank you. Well, I would like, just because the kind of audience we have, we have sort of a, uh, how do I want to say, social activist, high conscious, spiritual, Great. sacred group out there. Perfect. So I would love for you, I mean, as an overall arcing um, vibe that I'm sort of setting the stage for today is kind of problem solving. Yes. And um, so you were in a place where the problems, uh, well, or the challenges uh, are at you all the time. And so I'd love for you to share a little bit about, you know, just kind of how it, how you were a hidden figure <laughs> and, um, and like that. Well, uh, thank you so much. I, I love uh, talking about uh, the importance of being able to overcome challenges. Mm -hmm. And I had to do that in my own life. Uh, People Magazine called me the modern day hidden figure, which I'm so thankful for because I helped launch 28 uh, missions to space in the Space Shuttle Main Engine Program for the Space Shuttle Program that launched Endeavor, Discovery, Atlantis, uh, uh, Space Shuttles. And it when my when you read my book, Mathophobia, I, I share about my background about not only what it was like being a hidden figure, I guess you would say, when when I was launching rockets, but what also what it took to actually get to that point, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, because I had to solve problems not only within space flight and, and uh, bringing in these multi-million dollar contracts and, and getting astronauts to space, but it actually started when I was much younger, when I was a kid. Uh, I, I was never brought into a uh, prestigious type of rocket science preparation background, but rather I was a kid, grew up in South Central Los Angeles, in Los, uh, here in Los Angeles, and uh, we grew up in severe poverty. Mm -hmm. And it was a challenge every single day just to walk home uh, alive and, and not be shot down by gunshots and, and things like that. It was a uh, gangs so, were yeah prevalent. gangs were prevalent. It was a, a a great accomplishment if we got through the week with with being able to chew on ice. So mm -hmm. we would trick ourselves and not think we were hungry. Mm -hmm. Th that's the type of life I live, and I'm just very straightforward with that. And in that process of of going through that, I actually went on a field trip when I was. Uh, in first grade 
uh, the, to the Jet Propulsion Laboratory in uh, Pasadena, California. And it's there where I saw these gigantic jet engines and I saw these rockets and, and I went into their mission control room and I said to myself, I want to be just like those men. Now, the men I was looking at, the pictures on the wall, I remember them specifically. They were pictures of men. Uh, uh, they were all white men. They had glasses. Well, uh, all but one of them had glasses. Uh, they were launching rockets. And when I saw that, I knew I wanted to be, and I was going to be just like those men, but I had no idea that I was completely different. And I looked mm. different, and my background was different. But that was going to be the blessing in disguise mm. in my a complete transformation of being able to take the problem solving that I learned uh, in the hood, I guess you would say, mm -hmm. to uh, the educational arena, and then to launching rockets. And it was that same set of problem solving, but applied in mathematics. Mm -hmm. And then wow. later applied within rocket science. And now I'm applying that with how we can actually reshape our brain. The same mathematics on how we can change our lives. Whoa, that is so incredible. And by the way, I'm going to pour some water for you. <laughs> my very special uh, water into my very special glass because I know you're going to need it. Purple. I mean, I uh, love purple. It's my favorite yes. color. Yes, and, and you know, uh, yeah, perfect. <laughs> and we're going to really talk a little bit about, about or a lot about problem solving because I, again, like you guys know, with the political climate and stuff like that, it's about how to really buck ourselves up and, and work with ourselves to the max, as we used to say, so that we have the circuitry and the, the pillarness <laughs> to be able to, to be the light, to yes. be able to connect with other lights and, and shift this world. I just so thank you thank for you. being one of the pillars of light. Thank you. I want to honor, actually, I want to talk for a second about the actual hidden figures because I just find this so amazing and, and jump in any time. But um, I had so much fun researching for this show today. I mean, I usually <laughs> do a lot of research anyway, but today I was like, this is one of the reasons I love doing this show because I get to learn so many things. And I did see the movie. I could not wait to give my 15 bucks to the hidden figure movie. You know, it's like if we're going to give money anywhere. But this movie, for you guys who haven't seen it, go see it. And I think Hollywood, let's remember, for all its flaws and imperfections, is really the mouthpiece, the megaphone of the world, you know, here in Hollywood. We're at Sunset Gower Studio where much history has gone on here. And so being able to see these biopics or these different movies that tell this story, and we know it's dramatized a little bit, but still I feel like the heart is, is um, c you know, comes through. And so for the, for the Hidden Figures, the, the book was actually called The American Dream and the Untold Story of the Black Woman um, in Mathematics who helped win the space race. And the story is of Dorothy Vaughn, Catherine G. Johnson and Mary Jackson. And they were considered um, human computers. And of course, these, I'm just gonna read a little bit really fast so I can get through it. The three unknown space heroes calculated by hand the complex equations that allowed space heroes like uh, Neil Armstrong, Alan Shepard and John Glenn to travel safely in space, which was of course the unknown then. There was really no such thing as a computer, certainly not the iPhones that we just turned off. Uh, and anything that was would have filled this you know, whole space, and it was nothing like our iPhone. So they were doing things that were so, when we talk about imagination and, and the music that you guys heard underneath our show is actually imagination, pure imagination and imagine put together. You can't really hear it, but I composed that because that's sort of my new vibe right now is imagining. And so these guys imagined something that was so powerful. And I love this expansive level of, of you know, of imagination. And uh, I just quoted this one little bit um, from, uh, from the internet, and it says, the head engineer, this is part of the plot, Paul Stafford, who was played by... Um, uh, oh, I, I'm forgetting, but we'll come back to that. Refused the request of Katherine Johnson, played by uh, Taraji Penson, uh, P. Henson, to attend the editorial meeting about John Glenn's upcoming mission to become the first American to orbit the Earth. She was, it was just unheard of to have a woman, and of course she was also black, so the challenges she went through with that. And um, he was just really dismissive in his answer to her, and he said, there's no protocol for women attending. And then Johnson replies, there's no protocol for a man circling the earth either, sir. 
<laughs> so jump in. I'm chatting a bit. I want you to talk now. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I, her story is amazing. And her true life story is something in which we all would benefit from seeing it. And if any of you, if any of you have saw Hidden Figures, uh, you'll see these three strong, powerful women. Uh, played by great actresses, uh, where they w had to navigate their way as leaders, not only as women in an environment, but as women of color in an environment that was uh, strictly uh, not geared towards their particular success. And they found ways to be able to harness their skills and their abilities to be able to contribute to the American space race and help us get on on the moon and when I watched that movie myself tears started coming down my mm. eyes because as I watched that movie and I must be honest with you w I was actually scared to go see the movie at first because mm. I know the challenges that I faced working in that environment and I finally got up enough courage to see the movie and when I did see the movie and I remember looking at the screen tears came down my face because I, I felt not alone for the first time Mm. I felt that there were other people that understood exactly what I went through. And as I was watching Katherine Johnson's real life, true life story on film, I was seeing myself, seeing my own life story and even understanding how brilliant of a, a wonderful outcome my life has been, Aww. given the fact that what everything that I went through and, and what these ladies went through, and I found myself empowered, not only as a person who watched the movie, but as a person who saw the power and what I could contribute, not only within the space race, but what else can exist. And, and I found that when we step into situations and we are leaders in a situation where there's uncharted territory, mm -hmm. where we are not necessarily given uh, the, the protocol to say, to go forward, but really we are stepping into a new place in our life and we have to fill it out. We have to find it out. We have to find mentors. We have to, uh, uh assertively place ourselves in the place in which we will know we make an impact that is when we create change that's when we create innovation and that's when we birth great things not only in our, our life but in the lives of our nation beautiful thank you for that that was so beautifully said and as you're talking i'm thinking of of the movie and i'm looking at you and and i'm thinking of what goes on in in, in america and many parts of the world but right now it's really america and how the white privilege that i for example uh enjoy uh, many people who are white enjoy white privilege that's what it is and it's very un we don't even know we are enjoying it for the most part and so even in the movie that moment where uh, Paul um, the you know the lead lead uh, kind of producer of the whole uh, uh, challenger situation um, doesn't understand why one of his workers is always sort of gone for mm -hmm. an hour here and there, and then it comes to his attention yes. that there is not a bathroom in her area that she can go to. Exactly. And then he is, you know, then he goes down and he takes his hammer and he smashes down the colored only white only bathroom. And I love, did you not just love that? I, I and remember, guys, really this is in it. the 50s. This is like a time when younger people, you know, you guys don't even know <laughs> that this kind of stuff went on, especially if you live in California or New York. Well, a lot of people didn't know that, uh, although it had been a good 30 years since the, the making of that uh uh, it, 1961 is when the Hidden Figures was actually uh, prefaced uh, when this uh, scenes when these scenes were taking place, and then I started in the rocket science world back in 1998. So that's mm -hmm. almost 20 years ago. Uh, I was one of the few women uh, in the room. I, I can only speak about my personal experience, and it's this: I remember going into a room uh, where all of us were experts. And I had gained the ability to become an expert in my field of area because I knew every single bolt, every single weld, every single place where that engine could rupture. I knew about past experiences from all the different hot fire, what we call the engine test hot fires. I knew how they all uh, were tested. I, I had all this information categorized like a, uh, almost like an encyclopedia in my brain. And I was invited to this meeting as an expert because of the information in which I had spent tedious and long hours digesting and understanding and I remember looking at and sitting in this room and I remember looking around and I was the only woman out of 200 people mm. and then I looked around too I was the only uh, uh, person of color mm. that was mm. in that room and that was the first time it was so blatantly obvious to me mm. that not only women 
need to be in places of leadership but people of color mm-hmm. also need to be places in leadership yes. and it is uh, it is an opportunity for all of us to find gifted and talented people in all these different areas and find opportunities so they can shine, so they can provide what it is in which they are brilliant at. Uh, for me, in my particular situation, it wasn't much different. Thirty. That was the most shocking thing for me, watching this particular film and seeing their life and realizing, whoa, I went through that and that was 30 years later mm, and I was yeah. pretty surprised. And when we do realize that the perceptions of people and the stereotypes of people have to be broken, that's when we become empowered, when we can look at someone not by what they look like on the outside, not by how they carry themselves or what it is that they say or do, but it is their integrity of character and their determination to present something that is beneficial and helpful that is when we become empowered in being able to know we are now dealing with leadership. We are down, de- now dealing with the opportunity to change a situation because we are dealing with someone's integrity as well as their actions that back it up. Yes, and that is what makes great leaders too. Yes, and yes. when you were talking about the dates, that's actually, you know, of course you're correct in that, and thinking that uh, Martin Luther King coming along just a touch after that. And, you know, I don't know if you know about the story or the book, The Glass Universe. Do you know about The Glass Universe? I, a little, I know bit, a little about bit about that. that. It was written by David uh, DeVos Sobel, actually. And um, I want to tell you guys a little bit about this because I find this so amazing. This was in the late 19th century at Harvard College Observatory. They employed women who collected, studied, and cataloged thousands of images, get ready for this, John, of stars on glass plates. Wilhelmina Fleming, for example, classified over 10,000 stars. And remember, this is you know over 100 years ago. Using a scheme she created and was first to recognize the uh, uh, the existence of white dwarves. And this was, you know, the cons- uh, imagine the conditions were just ridiculous back then. Um, and then in 1935, which uh, the NACA, which is the National Advisory of Committee for Aeronautics, which of course, as you know, is a precursor to NASA, hired five women to be their computer pool at Langley ca- uh, campus. And in June 1941, President FDR issued, if we can believe this, the Executive Order 8802 banning discrimination in the employment of workers in defense or government because of race, creed, color, or national origin, but did not mention, which is, you know, incredible, great, thank you, but did not mention gender. So just a little more food for our thoughts today people (laughs) but is that just the coolest i i I believe it's the coolest and i believe that there's more leaders that can do that even today oh my gosh i mean that's the thing imagine imagine i mean somehow these women in the uh, in the late 19th century and in 1935 could imagine uh, you know things that people didn't really think were even possible and it was only a few hundred years before that that it was absolutely for sure that the uh, earth was flat and if you didn't <laughs> believe that you were a heretic and you were burned at the stake oh and by the way the earth is not flat <laughs> <laughs> and as a f- and by the way i understand from john can attest to this too that the earth is growing and you know all kinds of things are happening and it's not even perfectly round and it might even be hollow and oil can re you know it's like blood and it can and re, um, I don't know what the term would be, but regrow or recreate. I mean, there's, or not, do you, you know, know, there's. I love the, <laughs> do you know, I love what you say. There's a branch of mathematics called chaos theory. And I actually write about I this in uh, my second book, Answers Unleashed. Uh, it, it's it's fascinating because the, in chaos theory, there's like similarities. Like, for example, people don't know that how we got to Mars is through chaos theory. There's space is not all the same. You can go on a, what we call highway in space. You can actually zip to a planet based on some gravitational forces that are like a freeway. There's like a freeway in space opposed to like an area, maybe a couple of uh, hundred feet it, over to the left, you will completely be stalled. And so how we found those particular areas, and actually that was JPBL that did that, Jet Propulsion Laboratory, they used chaos theory, and the way that they modeled that is they looked at the inside of an oyster. 
and Ooh. how a piece of a sand goes inside and twirls inside of it an oyster to become a pearl was the exact same mimic way that the universe worked in order to get us over to Mars. Oh, and so there's these mimic oh these patterns uh, that exist on the planet. Like for example, the waves in the ocean are exactly like the waves in the air, jet streams. And so when people understand how the waves in the ocean work, then they can understand how the jet streams work, and they can better understand uh, how hurricane systems are formed and predict them with a more accuracy and that's actually due to the chaos theory mathematics and in in this oh, way it. that there's there's these the earth is is forming a, a, a chaos system mathematics meaning it is a living system mm. our earth is just like a living body just like we an have a ecosystem. body that is an ecosystem and it has uh, a way to regenerate itself, but it has to be taken care of. Just like it we have hearts, to take care lungs, of our own right? selves and our own body. Yeah. We have to water it. We have to give ourselves water. Otherwise, we become dehydrated. We have to make sure and take care of our health, make sure it has its vitamins, uh, make sure and place it in a calm environment. The earth is a living being. So it can restore if it's in the right environment to do so. Yes. And just like our bodies are able to do that as well. And Indeed. that's all about science. And people don't realize that science, and this is my personal belief, I believe science and spirituality and energy are all the same. What we see in science is how the energy transforms itself to play out. Mm. And what mm. we think of and what we believe in carries itself out in energy and then we see the evidence of it in science. And so when we look at science and then we look at where it came from and then we look at vice versa, we can look at science and figure out a, a general scheme of how things work. Now, it not only under, helps us understand logic, but it helps us understand purpose as well. And, and that's what I love uh, when I write in my book, Mathophobia, that what keeps us from understanding our purpose is fear. And I'm so happy in that book because I, I share how we can reprogram our brain so we don't have fear, so we can look at the purpose of, of what it is that we're doing on how we can solve a problem so we can get to an answer. Oh, my gosh. And I want to do a few more things in this book. And one thing that you brought to my mind, though, too, is the concept of God and science or yeah. sacredness and science or spirituality and science and for you guys out there I'm sure many of you know Matthew Fox and if you don't please research him or just read any of his I think he has 28 books right now uh, and he really really breaks down how um, how sacredness and science were all one for for thousands of years really until certain things happened in the religion world and politics got involved in, in the hierarchy and pardon me in the 14 and exactly. 1600s and you know so to understand how that separates out and i got to again i feel like i'm like uh, okay it's movie week here at sunny chase corral uh, <laughs> but i got the opportunity to watch this movie the other day uh it was so incredible it, i don't know if you've ever seen this but if you haven't you would love you of all people would love it it's called the man who new infinity ah do you love this movie okay. oh yay good i mean these are all surprises guys <laughs> i well, love it and i'm going to say a little bit about it can i oh or, yeah I mean, I well, please do so the audience Be knows knows because it's a little known movie and one of my fave actors dev patal the one you know who was in slumdog millionaire and all of that plays this character of a um his name is Srinivasa Ramanujan uh Ramanujan uh and it's a straight Ramanujan was a, a very poor Indian lived in Madras and he was a I don't I mean I guess now we would just call a, a savant or something he had the powers of mathematics that like no other and he was invited to Trinity College which was quite a thing and it was just before the war it was in the late 1930s actually and he um, he studied with uh, you know he studied at the college with Professor G.H. Hardy who was played by Jeremy Irons in the movie and uh, what the notes I took about it is that his discoveries would inspire and influence generations of mathematics, uh, mathematicians. And through the war, uh, this continued. And he had such incredible things that would come to him. And they wanted, um, they meaning the uh, academicians, wanted proofs of everything, steps and proofs and all of this. And he didn't have the ability to do that, meaning that these 
theorems, these these processes, these uh, you, all the terms that you know that I don't know in, when it comes <laughs> to mathematics, uh, came to him, and these were things that, that nobody had been able to figure out yet uh, at all, and he, they just came to him. And um, so he was... It was very frustrating because he couldn't uh, explain that. it. He couldn't well, prove he, it or explain right, it. Right, exactly. And he was, uh, but he did receive uh, the prestigious honor of being accepted as a fellow of the college, which was quite, quite a huge thing, um, and being recognized as a mathematician of international merit and importance, and um, including in the formulas uh, Ramanujan discovered were brought forward 80 years later, get ready, John, you're going to love this, to understand the behavior of black holes. Mm -hmm. Do mm -hmm. you love it? And then our friend and people, uh, many of you guys know out there, Nassim Haramin, the physicist and mathematician who's been at Conscious Life Expo, and he's, you know, one of our peeps today, is a physicist and mathematician. Um, and through his program, The Connected Universe connects math, stars, black holes, protons, and space, bringing many elements of the known and unknown together. So it's just, uh, and this is the last thing I'm going to say, and then I really want you to jump in. My point here is that... Um, Dev, who plays this character so beautifully, uh, Ramanujan, uh, it was absolutely for him God. It was absolutely for him God. Everything that was coming through him was God. And so when people are asking him for proof, it was, it was so frustrating because he was all about looking at the people and saying, do you not feel it? Do you not have intuition? Do you not trust? Do you not know that what I'm saying, you know what I'm saying is correct. You're looking at it. You're reading it. You're in these days, we would say you're getting the chills, which I'm getting right now, speaking even about it. And yet you want, you know, this backwards way of proving it is, it is people. And now we know it is and all of these modern day people are, are building on it. So, well, that's such a great thing. Um, yes. Uh, for me personally, I believe that God and science are one. Mm -hmm. I, I believe they're, they're, it's actually a three sided coin. If you will think of it I that like way, that. I like uh, that. It, what I I if I look back, uh, I look at Einstein in 1916. He created uh, the theory of relativity, and part of that theory was something that had never been proven before. He said, and this came from his intuition and his understanding of space and time, is that gravity gravity isn't a straight force; it travels in waves. And everyone thought he was crazy. They're like, "Oh, prove it." prove it prove it <laughs> and they're like he's like watch when it happens <laughs> and, and but he he ended up uh, passing away but a hundred years later 200 uh, 2016 a hundred years later it was proven it was proven when the LIGO found that two black holes collided and through their collision it created a wave a gravitational wave and that was the last part of einstein's theory that needed to be proven so the i the theory of relativity is actually proven sometimes when people come up with these divine uh in inspiration their job simply is to come up and produce the theory and it's someone else's to prove it we each have our own process in the big picture mm -hmm. not all of us are have all the answers it none of us none of us are god None of us have all spirituality complete. That's our job to work here. And, and we're we, part of each, we're little bits of each other. And that's what When we it. connect together, we solve the problem. Mm -hmm. and, and through scientists have their part that they uh, find. The, the theorists have their part that they find. The, the activists have their part on, on making sure, connecting it and, and energizing it. Everyone has their role. The communicators have their area. <laughs> Everyone has their role in, in making things work. Mm -hmm. And so when uh, when you read that excellent piece about the, the movie and about the the um, scientists, it was his job to create it. It was someone else's to prove it. Mm -hmm. And when we realize that we have a certain niche, we have something specific that we bring to the table that no one else has, but it's just us, that's when we become empowered. And for me, when I worked in rocket science, I realized that my job 
wasn't just to calculate the probability of catastrophic explosion in flight and sit in the mission control room and rec look at all the data for 13 hours to see things successfully fly. My job was to change the way that people were thinking in the, so they could change the way not only the, the design work, but change the way that they could incorporate other scientists in the future. That was my job. And when we realize that we're in certain situations for a specific reason, that's when we realize, oh, I don't care about what everyone else thinks. Mm -hmm. I'm here for what it is that I have to do. And you'll either see it or you don't. But the people that will see it will run with it. Well, and I really, while you were chatting, I was just writing uh, some notes because I, I so, the feelings that I was getting from what you were saying and from your book and these different movies I've seen is is first of all what else is there oh in God. other words oh right gosh, there's so much in I other can... words when <laughs> when i want to say deb but when uh uh Srinivas, uh came up with all these things and he's bringing them to trinity college you know here is this indian vegan uh meditative uh incense burning barefoot wearing non-wearing <laughs> person who comes to a place where you know and of course the weather is completely different and unfortunately he did get tuberculosis and he Aww. did pass away um it did get back to his homeland uh but did pass away a year later because it was just he couldn't even there was no food really i mean everything had lard in it or something especially back in the 30s they weren't mm. you know and in england everything was mutton and you know all of that kind of thing but anyway I feel like wh when you're saying about the leaders and being the light and being the pillar, like I was talking about and bringing the ideas and bringing the problem solving, I was thinking also that what, um, what Tr Srinivasa was bringing to the people was wherever we are right now, and that's what I want to even say to John and myself and all the people, you guys know John's our engineer and producer, when I say John, <laughs> who's in the room with us. Hi, John. Uh, hi, hi, John. Hi. Um, <laughs> that, we, that we know that when we're learning these things, that it's like, okay, I may not be a scientist or a mathematician. It's not, that may not be my, you know, my gig. Expertise. But uh, it may not even be my, it doesn't float my boat necessarily to be in that world. But what it does tell me is, that there is, again, imagine that, you know, like in the 1400s, what did people think were, was it completely impossible? We have it now. What did we think 30 years was impossible? We have it now. We didn't even have Facebook. You get, some of you guys are watching us on Facebook Live right now. We didn't even have that 11 years ago. Yeah. We couldn't imagine that we would be chatting with you right now, and you're on your computer, which w could not be imagined then. Um, <laughs> <laughs> to be to be listening to us <laughs> chatting, you know, I mean, me imagining that I could be in front of you guys. I, I mean, uh, and then in and the bigger thank picture, you for this opportunity too for people to understand th what it can exist. Mm. And, and you ask what can exist in in thirty years from now, and I in ten years from in now, ten in years, five years in five from years, now. I I'm I'm seeing what can. Yeah. Um. And you're bringing it. It it it's I realize and what you don't yeah. know. And I mean, that's yeah. the other thing. I, I want to have you keep talking. But what we don't know, like we realize that when we when we know all these things, I mean, oh, my gosh, it, many brilliant people have said things like the more I learn, the more I know I don't know. Um, the wisdom is in not knowing there's somebody who happens to be in our White House right now who is a, a blatant baby know-it-all and nothing can penetrate because the, the baby know-it-all fires all the people who do know, who can be around that person to, you know, to give the proper information about things that this person actually really does not know anything about and has an eighth grade education. But anyway, that uh, I'll uh, carry on. So knowing that we can n not know that we don't know. And what, what is next? What's next? Like when you said 30 years, I'm like, oh, my God, the, f the, the pace of what's happening right now. I feel like what, you know, they're already doing hovering cars. I, I can tell you. Okay, tell us. <laughs> the brain. The brain. The brain. We're going to figure out exactly how we think and how we can change our brain and how we can unleash our brain power. And you know what, there are many, like, yeah. you know, you know, Deepak and Gene Houston and their different people who are, because I are, had kids. Are understanding that. And they, uh, they, w when I was a mom, I mean, I'm still a mom, but when, you know, when you have kids, they tell you that your, the brain is really developed by five. And then they really say, well, it's really developed by 13. And then they said, well, it's 21. And that's why the drinking age, actually, for you guys, if you wonder why the American drinking age was 21, it was set at a health um, aspect because there was a time when people thought the brain stopped developing at 21 oh. and now we know it never stops uh, 
Yes, it never stops. And, and speaking about that, the frontal brain lobes uh, are re responsible for creative problem solving. Mm -hmm. And although they completely develop, and this is the part that actually turns on when we do science and when we solve problems, uh, they completely physically have its basic form at the age of 25 it can reshape its interior at any age. And that goes not only for the frontal brain lobe, it goes for the rest of the brain. Mm -hmm. uh, when I was working in science, I realized that this chaos theory mathematics, what we used to go into space, was the exact same of how our brain is shaped. Mm. So as we c found different pathways in space to be able to get out to far distant places, we have pathways in our brain to get us to the answer quicker. Mm. And, and people, uh, well, uh, this is my true belief. People will understand how brilliant that is. Uh, when I worked in rocket science and when I work with engineers, I saw something up close that very few people see. I saw inventors. Now, inventors have this ability to look at something before any evidence of it exists. Mm. They have the ability to transcend time. They transcend space and they're able to see something before it's created and see it so vividly that their job is to decide to create it and help other people see the same thing in which they see so it can be physically birthed and brought to life through science. Mm. So I figured out there's actually not just two parts of the brain, there's three. The first that starts everything working is the what I call the faith part of the brain. It's what I call the faith sector of the tree of brain, the three-sided brain. And it is able to see science before it is created. It's able to see the outcome of success before it happens. It's able to see the science principle before it's proved. It is the part of all of us that is able to transform situations and that energy from that part then goes to the left and right side of the brain and reshapes it. Oh. And so the left side, the, the right side of the brain uh, is the creative side and it's also the decision making emotional side. Something has to stir you enough to have you follow this and so when I was working with these engineers it would stir them so they would be stirred so much that they would spend long hours long hours like we just saw with hidden figures or uh, the scientists I work with they would spend sometimes sometimes seven eight nine o'clock at night just to finalize that one part that would give them the piece of the puzzle and it was that part of the creativity that came from that right side of the brain but then and there was staying with it and it's staying with it choosing to follow it choosing to develop a relationship with mm. what it was and mm. then there was the left side of the brain which was looking at the resources and how you're going to get this done like i have this this is the theory now how am i going to actually make get this there. work <laughs> and, and each part has it's equal side and so I truly believe that in the next 10 years we're going to not only be able to understand how to what we do is in self-directed um, neuroplasticity which is how we can reshape our own brain I have a strong belief that we're actually going to be able to see it as it changes I am so excited about that and one thing that uh, and I think that's so true and I love the concept that uh, many people will speak about now in the even the health world where we understand that you, what we have as a condition is not even aging or even something that we feel is completely you know literally set in stone literally mm. set in calcium or <laughs> calcified that it does change that uh, you know the skin in our body inside you know the, the that uh, that surrounds our organs changes some of them in three months I mean we can really really if we know that and we can feel that we can really allow healing to happen and just allow it already and chat with our mitochondria which is uh, actually the boss not the nucleus but anyway <laughs> um, and really allow that love to be going on and knowing the crystalline water in our cells as a conductor and just saying yes rocket rocket you know like <laughs> Dr. Emoto would say you know fill that you know be aware of that crystalline substance and know that it can be about the love which is beautiful or about the hate which is not and you know mm. like that and, and that's what I really uh, enjoy about this uh, time. Uh, people are really concerned about this, the the government and things like that. This is the most beautiful time that exists on face of the planet. Wow. Because okay. if we can understand the difference 
in character and action of not only leaders, but within ourselves yeah. and choose the path that is beneficial and loving and not only healing towards ourself, but in taking action to be able to create steps to be able to heal certain situations. That's when we find the power. Okay, let and me ask you. that's when we you, change things. That's right. And I didn't mean to speak over you. That's why I was excited because I wanted to mention something that I learned in your book, which what you're talking about uh, I can tie into something which is fear and creativity. Mm. So in the book, I, I mean, I, you know, we kind of hear this, that this and that, but in your book you really lay out, and I was able to understand it, that what actually happens when we have fear, that there are certain en um, uh, hormones and enzymes that are secreted. And then, um, but the frontal lobe, in order to be creative, problem-solving, uh, action-oriented, uh, uh, imagination, you know, seeing the solution, you know, like Einstein said, you can't create the uh, uh, the solution from the same place of the problem. Well, to take that way a bunch of steps higher into a physiological way, I realize that that's really true for myself, even in the last few days since I read this book, because there was a moment where I had uh, fear about something and I had to solve a problem right then. I mean, the fear was creating the problem and I needed to solve it right then I didn't have five days I had like three minutes and I and then I just thought oh wow Olympia's book that's right okay reptilian brain calm down <laughs> calm down Thank it's you. like I I needed to take my I it was literally like you know I had a bunch of dirty dishes in the kitchen and I had to just move them over people just I had to just move them over because I cannot have a clean view if I have a m messy kitchen so it gives me the chills to say that so I was able to physiologically you know like really feel that so when we have that fear and we have to solve a problem which often do come hand in hand mm. um, and I'm going to read something in your book about where it happens on the in your land in the in the <laughs> in the control room uh, ah. you know but but thank you for that because I was able even coming here I had a Thank couple you. things and I'm like calm down just get here just you just let the creative and, and you're not alone. I, I went through that, too. And all of us go through that. And thank you for sharing that, mm. uh, your experience, because uh, I think all of us need to be honest with ourselves. There, uh, Every single one of us deals with fear. Mm -hmm. Every single one of us is at a point in time where we are caught in real, like, panicking. Mm -hmm. And it mm -hmm. is up to us to realize the truth in the situation. That's yeah. that's so true. And so, uh, guys, I want you to really feel that through. And um Okay, another movie. I don't know. It's movie. It's movie science week. Guys, I really want to tell you about this. This is I'm changing the subject a little bit. <laughs> but this is super, super important. Um, I was uh, on a conference call with a bunch of people, not just me with Oprah Winfrey. And she really, really wants us to promote this. So I and I loved this book so much. I read it three years ago. It's called The Immortal Life of Henrietta Lacks. And what this book is about, and then Oprah, uh, oh, I read it, and it was so heavy on my heart for so many years because um, there was a woman named Henrietta Locks in the 1950s in Baltimore. She had a tumor, and she went to John Hopkins University, and they took a biopsy of her tumor. And in these cells, uh, they became the first immortal cell line, which means that they continue uh, duplicating, replicating, multiplying, multiplying outside of the body. No scientists, no doctors, no people had ever been able to cr capture this. They wanted it to do research and things like that, but they could not. And I'm talking fast now because we have like five minutes. <laughs> uh, but I want to get this in. And so what ended up happening was from this, from her body, she ended up dying a year later. Mm -hmm. And she had a family and, you know, all of this. Well, anyway, her cells are called the HeLa cells. They did not tell her. They took them, you know, and like didn't let her know. And it's HeLa, uh, Henrietta Locks. And um, this woman named Rebecca Skloot, I think, you, is a white woman who found out about this this and researched the hell out of it and then wrote this book and uh, this all these studies became the forefront of every medical study and breakthrough for cancer HIV vaccinations in vitro in vitro fertilization so we're gonna watch if it's okay with John a one-minute trailer but I, I think you guys I want you to see this movie so it's on April 22nd which is this Saturday at 8 p.m. on HBO and Oprah did it. Tell me when to stop talking, John. Okay. Oprah did it uh, when because she knew that probably people wouldn't go and buy popcorn and go to the movies to see it. So she partnered with HBO to bring this story to you guys. So here we go. For years, it seemed like a dream. 
about our mother? Could this be true? What you don't understand is, we didn't know nothing about nothing. Scientists had been trying to get cells to grow outside of the human body, but they would always die until Henrietta's cells came along. I want to write a book about your mother. Go Gila, go Gila, that's my mother. Hope I don't regret this. Everyone's saying Henrietta Lacks donated themselves. She didn't donate nothing. They took them and didn't ask. The hospital is guilty and somebody's going to pay. God wanna have a disease cure, he provides one for himself. Troubles. I don't know, Rebecca. I'm not doing anything behind your back. Henrietta helped develop the AIDS cocktail. Chemotherapy treatments. It's hard not to get caught up in hope when you've been powerless for so long. I know I'm a part of you, and you're a part of me. So please, guys, see this movie because it's a story that nobody really knows about except the few people who wrote this or read the book. And it's a story about, first of all, what one person can do. I mean, she is literally immortal. And we all know that we leave legacies. We all know that we have the choices. We all know that we have the choice to make a difference. We all know that our, our behavior and, and what we do and our life on this planet makes a difference. And this person, uh, it was so hard for me to read this book and then sit with it. You know, again, as a white person, I'm thinking, oh, my God, the mistreatment of people, you know, my brothers and sisters in the world. And to have somebody like this who literally changed the lives of millions and, by the way, made um, not John Hopkins. They didn't make money, but the pharmaceuticals made billions of dollars. Meanwhile, the family died in poverty in such a horrendous way. So I just think that it's a story that I re so respect that Oprah is having the um, nerve <laughs> to put forward <clears throat> because it's a little bit of a tough story, but it's a beautiful story in, again, what one person can do. And um, and what and how we make a difference. So thank you for letting me share that on your show. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. <laughs> but yes, yeah, so I want to spread the word with that. And John, I, we have like one and a half minutes, right? Um, so one quick thing that I want to read to honor you, Olympia. Um, one a little bit in the book I want to just read. Again, this is from Olympia's book, Math. Mathophobia. Uh, we are trained. Uh, this was in, you know, in her work. We are trained to watch events like a hawk. Failure is not an option. Success is now or never. And then she also says, as I reminisce, the mission control room taught me the best lesson of all. We are expected to solve our problems quickly. In this way, our individual missions are not delayed or impacted. Once we are aware of our goals, we must be prepared to create an action plan to stay on track. Despite our fears, individual missions are so vitally important that we must take charge of separate, uh, separate mission control rooms, our brains, that may hinder... Um, Let's see. And in it, we must correct anything that may hinder the brain from functioning correctly. We must secure our own mission toward success. Olympia, you rock, girl. Thank you. Woman, person, rocket scientist. Whew. So Thank what you. else can we say, John? Um, anything else we get to say? I so appreciate you guys tuning in all the time. Again, this is the Sunny Chase Show. Uh, we're here in Hollywood and follow us on all the stuff that we we do and uh, and guys I know John threw up a bunch of stuff on the on the screen for you to uh, see and how to get at Olympia and um, Google her see what she's up to and until next time just remember that even though we don't think we make a difference we do and so let us imagine that our life is so full and so beautiful and so exactly what we want and desire and let's stretch a little bit this week let's grow a little bit this week and think of something new 
let's do something new, okay? And let's report back next week. <laughs> Until next time, this is Sunny and Olivia <laughs> saying bye-bye for now.